Once again, welcome to Let's Talk More. Today, my studio guest is Vice Chancellor of University of Leicester. We're going to talk about challenges, achievement, and much more celebrating our diversity in Leicester and Leicestershire. Stay tuned. Let's talk more. <music> Nishan, welcome to Let's Talk More. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Romeo. Nishan, before we talk about your moving into Leicester, just tell us a bit about yourself. So I'm originally from Sri Lanka. I went to school and did all my primary and secondary education there. And I was living during the Civil War, so I'm used to seeing a lot of troubles uh, when I was growing up, when I went to school. And I was very good at doing studies and getting involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. And then I got a scholarship to come to University of Cambridge to do my undergraduate. And after I completed my undergraduate, I also had another scholarship to do my PhD. And I did my PhD and then I was at University of Bristol where I was there for 25 years. And then I joined University of Leicester in November 2019 as the Vice Chancellor. Sri Lanka have a very cricket Cricket, big fan of cricket, very good cricket team. Do you have any interest in cricket? Absolutely. I played a lot of sports. I love sports because I think it's a good way to bring people. And also there are a lot of characteristics that you develop in a sporting field. Determination, fighting till the end, playing as a team. And I love sports. And cricket is very popular, as you say, in Sri Lanka. But I did other sports as well. I played football. I played hockey. I did athletics. So I was doing everything. What's your favorite food? I like uh, Asian food. Uh, I like Chinese food. So generally, I enjoy. I like to try everything, and I've travelled a lot. I tried different cuisine. It's fantastic. There's so much variety in the world. Moving from Sri Lanka, what a pretty country, sunny all the time. Granted, moving into England, when you moved first day, what's your culture and what's your shocks? I'll share that. It was a culture shock. It was a culture shock. So coming into England for the first time, I studied in Tamil. So I never studied in English until I came to Cambridge. So that was a big shock. Under the accent was difficult. I go to the lectures and sometimes I won't understand the lectures. Uh, and then making friends was a bit challenging. But that's where the sports helped. I met a lot of good friends on the sp in my sporting activities. Um, and then the weather, as you said. But having said that, you're quite fascinated by snow, uh, although it's cold. But you're fascinated by snow and how that all happens. So I was just enjoying my first few years, just getting to, used to the country, meeting people and learning the way of life in this country. Everybody have a dream in childhood when they're growing up. What your dream was? So my father and mother are teachers. And I always wanted to go to university. And then I thought I want to be a, a university lecturer, professor. So I always wanted to be a professor. I don't know why. Uh, and that's why I'm very glad I was able to uh, realize my dream. So that's what I was driven by. Majority in our Asian background doesn't matter. Subcontinental comes South Asian from Sri Lanka, Nepal, or India, or Pakistan. All the parents, they want to they see the kids as a lawyer or doctor or dentist. Your parents have that. My parents didn't have any influence over what I did. It's quite interesting. People ask me whether I had parents telling me what to do. Just the contrary, because they were both teachers, they didn't. All they did, I think, provided an environment and allow and just talk. And that's what I've done with my children as well. I don't tell them what to do. Just have conversations, make them think, make, make them question things. And I think if you give those skills, then they can do well whatever they do. And also they can choose what they're interested in. So in my case, I like mathematics uh, so and uh, physics, so I went into engineering. Uh, my rest of the family, nobody's engineers. My brother is uh, doing English, another brother is economics, a brother is micro microbiology, so we all do different things. Nobody's a doctor. Moving from Sri Lanka to England, what's your first challenge? And you really, really struggle for that challenge to tackle it. So clearly coming to the UK with a scholarship, there was a lot of pressure for me to do well academically. And as I said, the system here is very different. Uh, the language and the culture was different. It's a culture shock and adapting the new way of learning in this country was different. So the first year was a challenge. 
and I want to make sure I do well and do the people who gave me the scholarship proud and that was my only intention and also go on to do great things in my life by doing well in my studies. So that was, I think, the biggest challenge initially. But later on, I just decided to make the most of the experience and did other things as well. How you can describe your journey from Sri Lanka to England? It's transformational. It opened up opportunities for me that wouldn't have been imaginable when I was growing up. And to see what it has done to me personally, the kind of people I've met, uh, the way it has opened up opportunities for me, given me ambition in life and told me what is possible. And that is transformational. What's your favorite book? Uh, difficult to say. I think it's very difficult to say. It's like saying which is your favorite child. You don't have one that you always say is favorite. So I always enjoyed reading about philosophy, um, religion, and so on. So one of my favorite books is called The Universe Next Door by a guy called James. It's about different religions, different philosophies of life, and try to make you understand different people, their way of their world views, so you can relate to people better. Uh, in terms of understanding them better. That's one of the... And then when I was growing up, I used to read b b books like Mario Puzo's book, like Godfather and so on. So that was quite fun. So yeah, I tend to pick anything that gets me interested. And the other one that I read uh, much more recently is called White Maasai. It's a very interesting book as well about a lady going and living in with the Maasais in Kenya and how she kind of made an impact in that community. You have any interest in kitchen cooking? Oh, I love cooking. Uh, I'm a good cook, I think, so I shouldn't be saying that. Uh, it's other people to decide whether I'm a good cook or not. No, I enjoy cooking, but I find it quite relaxing. The kind of job I do, you're always mentally occupied. There's always something to do. So it's nice to do an activity where you can switch off. And one of the nice things about cooking is that you have to cook, switch off, and you're concentrating on what ingredients you're putting in and the, how you're going to cook that particular meal. So I enjoy cooking. Uh, I have to say I do less and less now because of uh, time and so on. But if I get the opportunity, I would enjoy cooking. It's uh, I find it relaxing, and I also like entertaining people. So I find it uh, a very good way of bringing people together and sharing something with them uh, and have an informal conversation. I find that very enjoyable. Last few things on, on first part. Everybody has a hobby. What's your hobby was in childhood, and what is your hobbies now? So I always enjoyed sports, uh, and I carried on playing sports until very recent, team sports, for a long time. And then uh, I, due to time commitment and given my age, I can't do everything I used to do. So I now just try and keep myself fit. And uh, But I watch sports, that would be my hobby, I would say. Now I just follow sports uh, and wherever I can, I will go and watch live events or watch it on tally. And personally, I try to go to the gym and keep myself fit. Let's talk more about your role as a Vice Chancellor of the University of Leicester. Leicester is a very diverse. When you heard about this job, what first thing in came in your mind? I was very attracted by Leicester because people knew about the football and King Richard III. So I knew something, but I think the biggest thing that was uh, attractive to me was the diversity of the city. Uh, it's a city that is a real melting pot of different cultures, different ethnicities. And I was very attracted by that. And uh, I thought, yeah, I could enjoy this role. I could fit in. And that's what attracted me the most. When you take over your role as a vice chancellor at the University of Leicester, what's the biggest three challenges for So Leicester is a great university. It has a very good reputation. When I got the job, everybody was so happy for me that I'm getting moving into a good university. And I was very proud that I got the job at Leicester as well. But you don't know uh, until you come and really have a look and meet people. So what I discovered when I came here, the first challenge I felt is that Leicester had a fantastic reputation, but somehow it is not punching above its weight recently. So I needed to give the confidence and ambition for the university. Uh, the staff are fantastic, so I want to make sure they feel they believe in themselves and they go on to achieve great things. The second challenge I felt is that this university was not as well connected as I would have liked with the rest of the community in the city. So I wanted to prioritize that. So I did a lot of work on that. And the third is I felt that the university didn't have a clear mission and focus. I felt it is important, that a clear identity, what it is, what it stands for, what its priorities are, where it wants to make a, 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 reputa a reputation for itself. And I felt those are the three challenges, give the ambition for the university and confidence 
connect with the city and have a clear focus and mission. When you joined your role was locked down the past few years, everybody have ups and down and low and high time. How much impact have in your personal life and in your role? So lockdown has been very difficult for everybody. Uh, I think for me, I was fortunate. I started in November, so I was able to get to know the university for four months, which helped because otherwise I was kind of managing the university remotely for about 20 months. It would have been difficult if I didn't know the staff, my team. So that was quite helpful. But even then it was hard because when you're in university, the fun part of it is meeting people, being with students, being with staff. So when you're in lockdown, you're not having access to any of that. And particularly the challenging bit was how do we look after the students, particularly those who were thinking of graduating and moving on to the next stages in their life. They were massively impacted and I was very concerned about the impact it's having on them. Similarly, I was concerned about staff who were vulnerable, who were losing family members because of COVID and the impact. They can't get the support they need during that time. That was something I was concerned about. So those are the two things that I primarily uh, concerned about. The third thing that I was worried about is longer term, what impact this is going to have on the university and society as a whole, because there have been significant disruption. But I was very pleased that it didn't have any immediate impact other than it disrupted my children's education as well. But personally, I didn't have any kind of uh, family members who, were, who lost their life due to COVID, shall we say. What's the most memorable time at the university as a vice chancellor? You're two years on, what's the most memorable your time so far? Okay, there are two uh, events I would say that stand out for me. One in, I think in November, uh, February or December, we had an event called DNA 35. It's the 35th anniversary of the university, Alec Jeffries discovering the genetic fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting. So we had an event to celebrate. And we had a fantastic event. The family of Don Ashworth was there, for example. They were relating the story. David Baker was there talking about his contribution to solving that murder. And we had an opportunity to do, see how a small activity in the university in genetic fing DNA fingerprinting has not only impacted local community, but opened up a new field for the whole world. That was phenomenal. And that all happened in Leicester. And I think that was great. And it was a pleasure to have the mayor, our uh, late Simon Cole, was there giving speech of how it has transformed policing and how he was saying it takes months to solve now. Within hours, they can catch a potential suspect because of that discovery. I was very proud of how Leicester has made an international contribution in that field. The other one I would say for me is I launched the university strategy where I want to take the university. And I was quite proud of the reaction I got from the colleagues about how ambitious and uh, how that is a good strategy to take the university forward. And people were kept buying into that vision and the plan. For me, that was quite pleasing because that's a lot of work, taking talking to university. But the fact, what was pleasing is that they feel this is the direction of travel they want to be part of. And I was pleased that I was able to achieve that. Now, University of Leicester celebrating 100 years. What is your proudest moment Oh, we had a fantastic centenary event. We had lots of events to celebrate. I think one event that I was quite pleased about is we had a weekend to bring the community to on campus to showcase the work we do and show how the university is uh, uh, transformed in 100 years in terms of the number of people we graduate, number of projects we support. And that was a very good event, lots of engagement. So that was one event, but I think there were other lots of events that we did. We had an event in Attenborough Art Centre, which is the same time we were celebrating the Leicester Symphony Orchestra's 100th anniversary as well. That was a, a really fantastic occasion. And then in the De Montfort Hall, we had a concert, which was again a nice moment where the Leicester University and the Leicester Symphony Orchestra were celebrating 100 years. And we also had many other events, for example, Space Park opening. Uh, we had an alumni dinner uh, two weeks ago. We had 150 people there. Again, a very happy occasion in one of our newly opened Percy G building. So again, I can't give you one event because there were so many nice events. So those are the things that I think were memorable. What could be done more, make more impact and awareness in the local community about Leicester University of Leicester? So Leicester University is very engaged in many areas. So as I said, for example, in medicine, all our research program involved the local community. So we, at the moment, nationally, 
recruit the most diverse patients into any recruitment trials in medicine and in COVID or any other diabetes or cancer. So that is something that shows a real connection between the city and the university. Similarly, right now, as you know, in the cathedral, there's work going on in the cathedral and the university archaeologists are working with the community to see how they can support that redevelopment. And again, Space Park, we are in uh, Pioneer Park, working with the local community. Kids from the local schools come and see how space as an opportunity for them, something to aspire to. It's not just about sending everybody to the moon or uh, to Pluto. It's about how do we make sure they understand there are other career opportunities around space technologies. So I think we're doing a lot. But I think one of the areas where I think Leicester needs to, university needs to do more, but I don't think it's the university on its, can, on its own can do this but the other uh, players need to contribute as well. Despite the success and the reputation of Leicester, it has significant challenges. It is, there are parts of Leicester, it's one of the most deprived in the country. Now We cannot be a successful society, successful city, if we have that level of deprivation in the community. So what I would like to do is to work with businesses, the community leaders, the city leaders, to see how we can all pull together to raise the uh, life uh, opportunities for these communities so they are all uh, successful as the rest of us are. So that's one area where I think we could do more. How much impact have this cost going, leaving cost going up high and people are struggling outside? So education, how much impact have, and especially in the student's life? It's difficult to say. It's too early, I think. Uh, the cost is going up uh, and uh, we all already seeing, despite that, young people primarily they see the value in university education they think it creates many opportunities for employment and opens up opportunities in many areas so i don't think university demand will go down in fact i think the demography up shift showing that there is more and more interest in university but i think what we might need to think about are how do we support the students during their time in university so that might mean how do they how do we reduce the cost of uh, their university education both in terms of accommodation, living cost, and the cost of uh, everything associated with the university education. But I think in the short term, I don't think it'll be a massive impact. But the long term, young people and also uh, mature learners will ask the question rightly, what is the, op what is the gain by going into universities? The amount of investment I'm making into university education, is that going to pay dividends? And I certainly think it will, but we need to articulate that better so they are equally convinced this is the right choice for them going to university, get the skills, because it will open up other opportunities for them. I heard a few of them students, and they very enjoy your lectures. You enjoy being sitting in your office doing a, a as a vice chancellor role or being as a lecturer? I like meeting people. I like teaching. I like researching. So I'm, yes, I'm in the office, but I'm more out and about. Uh, and as you said, I teach and I enjoy teaching. It's fantastic to explain something to somebody and the light bulb moment, they just learn something and they, wow, and that I enjoy. And also, when you're in a university, you're there to educate the students, so it's nice to continue to do that. It's challenging with my other responsibilities, but I still do it because I think it's fun, it's enjoyable. So yeah, it's about balance. I like, at the same time, I enjoy meeting people like yourself. I attend various events in the city, nationally, internationally, meeting some really cool, interesting people who have done great things in life. The opportunity to meet with them is good, I enjoy that and also meeting with other staff in my university who are doing really passionate things about they want to make a difference. And it's nice to talk to them and find out what motivates them and why they want to make a difference. Being a vice chancellor, very responsible role, very busy, very unsure, but how do you manage personal life and your day-to-day -day role? It's always difficult. I think, especially the kind of work I do, uh, you very often do things which are not personal, not work, it's a, a bit of both. So you have to kind of find the right balance. So all throughout my career, academic career, I try to keep the weekends free. Uh, it's tend to be for me to do other things, uh, especially for family. And even now in the university, I don't send any emails on a Saturday or Sunday. And I've told my team we shouldn't, so I've always operated that way. Um, so I think that kind of creates a dear, clear demarcation between the kind of the working day. Uh, but. Normally, the evenings on a weekday, I shouldn't be working, but I'm probably working. 
so it is a challenge, but you have to constantly ask yourself, am I doing more? But sometimes other people help you. So, for example, my children or my wife will say, you're spending too much time uh, on your iPad or phone, so then I know I need to stop. Uh, but you have to always kind of ask yourself the question, but also having a plan would help. So as I said, in my case, the plan is Saturday, Sunday, I will try and not do, although I might do a bit of work, but predominantly not much. Nishan, finally, how you can describe University of Leicester? It is 100 years old, started with 11 students, and now it's got 20,000 students, uh, start with three members of staff, now it's 3,500 staff, it's a success story. It's going to be even greater success story in the next century. Sean, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure.